Praise the Lord. Well, good evening, everyone. This is Brother Smith from First Gospel Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, appreciate um, all the people of God. Appreciate all the prayers for those in the body of Christ that have suffered with this viral disease. It seems like there's evidently some uh, somewhat of a um, surge in some places at least right now and, and then of course we're headed into flu season so they're a little bit worried about our our flu season together with the COVID virus uh, you know being a more problematic time during the winter months so we need to pray and uh, pray for Pray for the leaders of our country. Of course, we do know that our um, uh, presidential election is almost upon us. And uh, of course, I'm praying myself. I'm not, you know, I feel like the Lord. God sets up kings and he tears them down. And you know, the, the heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord, the Bible says. So I know God is in charge. I also know that God sometimes doesn't give the best leader for a nation because of, of sins of people. The Bible shows us that, that many times God has given wicked kings uh, because the nation wasn't worthy of a good a good or righteous king. And <clears throat> so I don't know, you know, I don't know exactly which way the Lord's going to point at this time or who God is going to set in, uh, in the presidential office in the United States. I know you can say that the Lord is in charge of it. And I know that the people vote, but I do believe God puts it in their hearts and in their minds of what to do uh, because God's very much involved in what's going on in the world. And so <clears throat> I know Jesus, you know, we've always said Jesus is the head of the church, but, but uh, he also with the Father is controlling everything in this world. Uh, God's in charge of the nations. He's in charge of what goes on in this world, it's, you know, these things are not ran by man. It's ran by God, and and uh, he's going to see to it that his plan is fulfilled. If you didn't think God was involved in it, then the, you'd have to do away with prophecy. You'd have to know that God's very much involved and, and uh, seeing to it that his plan, that's one of the magnificent things about God is he he said so uh, there's so many variables about God it looks like the Lord allows some things to take place by nature you know like for an example the uh, the uh, principle of reaping and sowing God doesn't have to interfere with that altogether uh, God does, I think God does interfere with things that would inter, that would hinder his plan. And so in that respect, you have to know by God's foreknowledge and by his, the operation of God that he's, uh, he's in control as much as, as um, to see, to see to it that his, his plan is going to go forth. And uh, but but the thing about it is, is God is so uh, loving, He's so full of mercy, so full of grace. The Bible said that if uh, if there was a smoking flax, He'd fan it. If there was a bruised reed, He would, uh, you know, He He would try to heal it. Uh, uh, the Lord wants to save everything. It's not his, uh, the scripture says it's not his will that any should perish. That, that's the mind of God. God would that all of us could be saved and that no one would perish. Just 
think of the cardinal scripture that in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say they would not, but he said they should not because of his love. Um, if someone believes in him, and that's not talking about believing on God or believing that he existed, but it talks about believing in God and the respect of believing that he's sovereign, believing that uh, his plan is absolute, believing that his commandments and his instructions, his judgment is righteous, and that if we don't heed to God's instruction, if we don't you know, we, we've said many times of, of the last few years that about God's judgment. That God's judgment is first, I would say, I, I like to, to start off with informative judgment. That God informs us by giving us knowledge. And in that, he instructs us. That knowledge instructs us. This is part of God's judgment. God's judgment is instructive. He didn't start off, you know, uh, penalizing, chastising, or even severely correcting. God starts off. He, he's a good father. It's like raising a child, uh, a, a little child. You don't start off uh, chastising or, or taking a rod to a child, whipping a child, but you start off informing or instructing a child. That's part of your judgment uh, to, a, to a child. Uh, there's a scripture in Hebrews. Uh, let me see right quick if I can find it for you. <clears throat> uh, in the 12th chapter of Hebrews here, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says, <clears throat> uh, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Of course, I do believe Paul wrote this or uh, had it written. Uh, and of course, here he's dealing with chastising. He's dealing with the more severe part of God's judgment. But I want to read on. It says, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Lord chasteneth not? But if you be without chastening, whereof all are partakers. In other words, if you're, if you're one of God's children, he is going to chasten you because your, your livelihood is going to require it. You see, right now we're all living... Um, this, we're born, the Bible says, a man is few days and full of trouble. <laughs> we're all born in sin and shapened in iniquity. Let me, let me refer to that just a little bit. We're, we are, we're born in a sinful nature. I mean, you can't, you can't accuse a little bitty newborn baby of committing sin, but he's in a sinful nature. He's in a fallen nature of Adam. See, when God, when God created Adam, he was a son of God. God create God created Adam. He was perfect. He he gave him a knowledge. He put him in a garden, a uh, paradise, and gave him enough knowledge. I don't. You know, I don't know, I don't think there's ever been ever a, a person, not even Jesus Christ was created this way. Jesus was born as a newborn baby. Uh, he was born of God, but Adam was created. When Jesus created Adam, he was created a grown man. And he was given enough knowledge. Think about what all he did. He named every animal. He had dominion over everything. 
uh, God gave him that much and he had enough knowledge not to sin. He, he had enough, he was in a place with God just like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born in this world and brought up as a, as a, as a, from a baby, but by the time he reached, let's just say the account, the age of accountability where God uh, required his obedience in everything. But you have, to, you have to see, see, he was born of God, not of man. He wasn't born of Joseph. He was born uh, Mary. Uh, he was produced in Mary's womb, but his father was the father in heaven. He, his father reduced him to a seed, put him in the moon, womb of Mary, a virgin, the virgin Mary, and, and she produced a human child born of God, just like Adam was born of God. Um, and if Adam would have been obedient to God, not fell, see, the, none of the rest of us were born of God. We were born of Adam. We were produced by Adam's, Adam's fallen nature. We weren't produced of God like he was. And so therefore, that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. He told Nicodemus that. He told him, he said, you know, that, that which is born to flesh is flesh, but that which is born to spirit is spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, or before the day of Pentecost, the 14th chapter of St. John, uh, the Lord began to explain to his disciples. They didn't understand what he was explaining. They didn't understand really where he was coming from. Um, you know, all of Israel was looking for a Messiah to come and be a king over Israel and to cause the, the nation of Israel to be become a the nation on the earth that God and they that God had was raising up among men. They didn't understand really how Jesus's coming was going to be, and uh, they were still looking at it as being under the law. And uh, so Jesus's coming was was so different. Sometimes it makes me wonder if the coming of the Lord down here is it going to somewhat catch us by surprise that, uh, you know, that it's going to be somewhat different than what we're imagining in our minds. Of course, we can, we have the early church as the pattern of the coming of the Lord and of God's judgment. I was mentioning, I was mentioning that, um, uh, of how God's judgment is taking place and is going to take place. Let me let me finish reading here just a little bit concerning God's God's judgment. Here he's dealing with the ultimate part of God's judgment and chastisement. Um, verse eight. Uh, I'm in Hebrews twelve, verse eight says, "But if you be without chastisement, whereof." all are partakers, everybody. Then are you illegitimate children? I won't read that word. And some son, and not sons. Furthermore, we have uh, had fathers of our own flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall not, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live. For they, our fathers, verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our own profit, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, or yeah, joyous, but grievous, Nevertheless, after it uh, yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So then he says, wherefore lift up your 
the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it be rather let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God. See, some people don't think you can fall of the grace of God. I don't know what they do with that scripture. Least any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. In other words, you, you could be troubled, you, not not a, you know not being willing to receive correction from God or even chastisement. Um, but like I said, we are we number one. You first are going to have to be born again, uh, born of this nature, born of this Holy Ghost nature. That's a born again experience that they all waited on on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Jesus explained that in, in St. John. Let's go back to the 14th chapter of St. John. Uh, really didn't have intent to talk on this. But um, I, might, I might say something about it since I've already got this far into it. Uh, in in the 14th chapter of St. John, let's just start in the first verse because this is a very, very important chapter. And first, uh, St. John, verse 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples, preparing them for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's preparing them for a new birth because he knows he's fixing to leave this world and he, it is super, super important to him. The reason he came to this world was that we might be born again. See, the religious world teaches, uh, and I'm talking about Christianity. I'm not talking about other religions. Other religions are false religions. But the religions of Christianity are uh, they teach that you're born again in the in in repentance? Well, many people repented under John's baptism, the baptism of water. That was that ushered Christ in. He was the forerunner to get us to repent. You could repent under the old covenant by sacrifice, but. Uh, John the Baptist had a new prophetical message on being baptized in water and repenting. Even Jesus said that he must fulfill all righteousness by obeying the commandment of being, uh, of repenting and being baptized in water. Uh, water baptism, Peter said that it's not, it's an answer of a good conscience towards God, but it's not the putting away of the flesh. Uh, you can't get rid of the fleshly nature just by being baptized in water and repenting. It takes a new birth and a new creature. Paul called it the inner man. He called it the, uh, the new man. Uh, he called it a new creature in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Uh, and so... Uh, the apostle or, or Jesus here to his apostles was explaining to them that he was leaving this world but that there was a comforter and he explained very explicitly that it was the Holy Ghost. Let's read a little bit. It says, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm in the first verse. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, which is the church, by the way, are, and it's called the house of prayer. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus was going to prepare a new covenant. He was going to 
uh, make it possible that men could be born again. His sacrifice accepted of God was going to usher in a new covenant and that new covenant would be uh, that covenant would be ushered in through the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and and, let, and and these mansions that word by the way mansions is from the Greek word uh, mone which means uh, an abode and, and I'll explain that to you a little more as we go on here He's saying, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. A lot of people interpret this, that I'm going to go prepare uh, heaven. I'm going to go fix a place in heaven. Let me tell you something. God didn't need to fix nothing in heaven. Heaven was already fixed. Jesus wasn't going to fix heaven up so that we could go there. He was fixing a place right here on this earth in a new covenant. And let's read on because he explains that. And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again. He did come again on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and I'll receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. He wasn't saying, you know, I'm going to heaven and I'm going to be in heaven. I'm preparing that so you can come there too, so you can be where I'm at. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he was saying. This chapter when you read the context of it, you'll have to see that that wasn't what he was saying. What he was saying is, is I'm going, I'm going to prepare a place in a new covenant for you so that where I'm at, that is I'm born of God and I'm living a, a, a life of a creature of God that has, I've overcome the things of this world. I've, been set apart from this world. Remember he told his disciples, I, uh, he said, I'm not of this world. And he told them, you're not of this world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And uh, that's those are some of the things that we and I are, are need to realize. You know, here of late, I've been talking quite a bit on the book of Revelation and on all of the prophecies that must take place by the end of the Gentile world. That's all well and good, and it is necessary that we understand the whole realm of God's plan. We, we need to understand doctrine. We need to understand prophecy. But remember, our first love is being born of God. Our first love is learning to our re de developing a relationship with him. You know, he told the church at Ephesus in the first letter in the book of Revelations to the seven churches in Asia, he said, because you've left your first love, he, he said, I have some things against you. And he said, except you go and do your first works over, I will remove your candlestick. You know, that candlestick was talking about the second heaven or in the temple you know there was three places in the temple the outer court the holy place and the holy of holies and the holy of holy place is where the candlestick was and that was a sevenfold light that candlestick had you know had uh, arms coming out from the stem of the candle then two on each side at the bottom two in the middle and two at the top and in each one of those arms of the candle was a bowl that was filled with olive oil. If that olive oil was trimmed every day, that kept and they were that olive oil was lit, lit with and was a fire, and that was seven lights, seven lights in that candle. And that those lights represent the sevenfold light or the sevenfold understanding that's what light is it's understanding you can see if there's enough light you can see and and when you get all the light there is which is what the number seven um, represents then that sevenfold light gives you a complete understanding of the things of God it takes time to get that well God was going to remove 
that church back there, that New Testament church had a candlestick light. It had a full understanding of God's purpose. But that church, after God reaped that world, fell away and God started with the Gentiles. And we've been nearly 2,000 years now in this Gentile world. And it, it was started off in darkness. It started off in a fallen condition. With, and God's had to restore. The church is still in a restorative mode. We're not fully restored yet. That's why we have all of these different religions. I know most of you in the body of Christ know what I'm saying. But there's people listening that need to hear what I'm saying. And so it won't hurt you to hear and be reminded again of our vision of knowing that it's necessary that the church be restored and to know how all of these different uh, ideas, the ideology that's in Christendom, in the, in the different Christian churches and organizations that don't see things alike, alike that's called Babylon in the Bible, and it means confusion. The word Baal... Uh, Babylon means confusion. And there's a lot of confusion among God's people. That's why one group teaches one thing, one the other. That's certainly, God's not the author of that. God is not the source of that. God is working and laboring to see the church restored. And in the end of this world, it will be fully restored. If you know enough prophecy, it will be fully restored. And so... Uh, let me get back to this chapter. Uh, the uh, uh, He was saying, where I am, there you'll be also. He was talking about the place that I'm in, in God. The uh, relationship that I have, a born, I'm born of God. I'm going to prepare that and make that possible for you, that you can be reconciled to God through a new birth. And with, whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Now remember, he's talking to his 12 disciples here. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? <laughs> you know, this was foreign to their ears to a great extent. I mean, he thought, I, we don't know where you're going or how you're going to get there. You know, he's talking to him about leaving uh, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. That they're thinking, how's this going to happen? Thomas speaks out. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. And he's talking to his 12 disciples here. Remember They've been with him for three and a half years of his ministry. They've seen many miracles. They've seen the manifestation of God. They felt that deep, pure spirit of God in its anointing that was on Jesus and watched the power and demonstration of the spirit uh, that, that bore witness. God bore witness by his spirit and by the workings uh, that he caused Jesus to do uh, that stood with him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Jesus said unto them, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. What he's saying, he wasn't saying you see my Father. Uh, in the Old Testament, Abraham saw Jesus. Moses saw Jesus. But when it comes to seeing the Father, remember Moses wanted to see him, but God said, no, no man's ever seen my face and lived. God hid him in the cleft of a rock there in the mountain. He passed by and let him see his hinder parts. But no man has ever seen God the Father, never saw his face. 
not, not here on this earth. And so Jesus was saying, when you've seen me, you know, God's fully manifested himself in me. I'm a human born of God, just like Adam was created and a human made, created by God. And he was God's son, but he did fall. And therefore he didn't fulfill God's purpose that eventually God, if he would have lived a sinless life, which he had the power to do just like the, Jesus had that power, um, then uh, he would have eventually, no doubt God would have had him produce, uh, God would have produced through him uh, children through a new birth, through, through the spirit of God, not through the fallen nature of Adam. Um, anyway, he's telling them that God's dwelling in me, you know, and God, I'm in him and the father's in me. He explains a little while the father's going to be in me like I'm in, I'm in him, the father in me and we in you. Now that don't mean that we've seen us, you've seen God, but if we are born of God, and God dwells in us, and Christ dwells in us, we should finally develop. See, one of the things about us is, is that we're born of the fallen nature of Adam. And then when we're born again, we've got to overcome that old nature. And we've got to be clothed with righteousness in this inner man. And that's an operation of God. No man can do that himself. It's going to take God to help us do it. Let's go on. Uh, verse 11 says, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. Jesus was one man. He was one man of God. He, he, if he could take what he had and distribute it among 12 men, and then those men could take it and distribute it among many, it would do far more than just one, even the child of God could do as far as bringing people. It's, the, it's God in Christ, in his apostles in a ministry, in the people that receive it. And uh, it's going to multiply. It's not just going to be adding, adding, but it multiplies. It's a multiplication. And when you shall ask in my name, that will I do. What you shall ask in my name, whatsoever you ask in my name, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, you know, a lot of people get the idea, you know, I'm going to ask in the name of Jesus. That's not what that's talking about. His name is his character. His name is his authority. See, you, you could, you could, um, you know, if I tell my wife, when I married my wife, she took on my name. And she could go places in the authority of my name and she could do certain things that using the authority of my name, she could get accomplished for herself, for her children, for our family. She could sign a check. She could sign my name to it. She operated in my name and she had authority to do that. And she could accomplish certain things and with that authority of that name. Well, Jesus... You know, for us to learn how to operate in his name, we're going to have to have a relationship with him even much closer than a wife has with her husband. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to operate under his authority. We're going to have to operate under his instruction, under his commandments. We're going to have to have a relationship that when we ask for something in his name or in his authority, that is, we know God's, mind. It's a spiritual walk and it takes time to develop in that spiritual walk. Uh, now verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I'll pray the father and he'll give you 
another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now watch these scriptures. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. Now look at this. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. See, the Spirit of God under the Old Covenant was with God's people. It, it how did he say it? He dwelleth with you, but he shall be. He's telling these 12 apostles, he shall be in you. And of course, that still, that still didn't make a lot of sense to them. They're hearing something new. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you, you see me, because I live, you shall live also. See, they were, no man was alive unto God as a new creature through a new birth. They were alive, but they weren't, they didn't, they weren't alive unto God as a child of God, born of his nature. That's what he's talking about here. Because I am alive as a child of God, the son of God, you will be alive as a child of God. Verse 20, at that day, you shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. See where he said, my father's in me. When you've seen me, you've seen my father. My, my father dwells in me. He's saying the same thing here. In that day, when you receive this comforter, he's gonna make it even more clear in a minute. At that day, you shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. He that hath my, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I'll love him and we will manifest uh, and will manifest myself to him. Uh, Judas Iscariot, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. This is the other Judas. Uh, this is Jude. Our, uh, he was of uh, James, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, this is one of the apostles. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, this is an important verse. If a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we, Jesus and his father, will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, let me, let me show you something. In the very first chapter where he said, in my father's house are many mansions. It's the exact same word here. This word, make our abode with him. The translators translated it abode here where they translated it mansions back in the first verse. It could have said, in my father's house are many abodes that God's going to abide in you through the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, through a new birth, you are going to be born of God, his nature. You're going to be born of that nature, that Holy Ghost nature. It He'll abide with you in that nature. You're born of that nature. Now, when you're born of that, you're born to, you were born of Adam's nature and you're born of God's nature now. So now you've got two natures and you're gonna to have to overcome the Adamic nature because that nature cannot be saved. But it's this new man, this new nature that you're gonna to have to develop and, and, and mature in. Uh, like Jesus grew up from a little child, he matured in that nature. He overcame uh, the, the flesh that he was born of, the human, the flesh, like Adam had flesh, he was subject to temptation. See, God's not subject. God tempteth no man, neither. He's, he's not tempted with evil, neither can he be, James said. But Jesus was as a, because he came here so that he could be a faithful mediator, Paul said in Hebrews. 
and and that he could be a faithful high priest uh, and a mediator to us. If he if he didn't come here and, and understand where we're at, what we're going through, and the example of how to live a life in this new covenant, this new birth. Remember, don't discount this. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And saints of God, that is not through repentance. People that were repented and, and uh, uh, baptized in water, that, you know, as I said, Peter said, uh, he said that, it, you want to see that? I don't know. I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to take up too much time, but I don't, I don't want to. Uh, some, sometimes it does good to see scripture. Um, uh, look, look in the uh, what is it? The third chapter of First Peter. No, yes, for third chapter of First Peter. He was talking about uh, uh, He's talking about the ark and how eight souls were saved in, uh, by water in the ark in the 20th verse of, of 1 Peter 3. But in the 21st verse, it says the like figure, talking about the like figure of God saving eight souls by water in the flood of, uh, with Noah. He used that as a type. The like figure where to even baptism doth also now save us, not to the putting away of the flesh, the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is, you see, we water baptism doesn't put away the filth of the flesh, but it does answer a good conscience. In other words, when when you repent of your sins, every man, go back to St. John 15 now, every man that God deals with. You see, I cannot convince you to repent of your sins. Only God can do that. Only God's spirit. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. God, God has to reach down and touch your life. To me, that's an amazing thing that God, the creator, the magnificent God, creator of all, the source of all things, would individually reach down and touch my life, touch your life, and draw you to his son, to salvation, to his plan of salvation. No man cometh unto me except my father draws him. That's what causes you to repent. See, I could I could do like some preachers and preach a message and scare you and and uh, scare you so bad that that you'd run to the altar, but that would be man's tactics. But when the Spirit of God touches your life, when God begins to, uh, His Spirit comes on you, and God begins to deal with you and conviction comes on you, and faith, God brings you to a place that the word of God, faith, the Bible said, comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and you hear a word of God. I don't care if a preacher preaches it, if you read it in the Bible, or if a saint even quotes it to you and tells you what the Bible says, but if it's anointed of God, if God anoints you and touches you, I've got a cousin. He's not alive anymore, but he re, he was he was uh, in high school when he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But he blackslid and got away from God. But one day, he was in his bathroom, and God was dealing with him, and he he fell down in the bathroom and began to pray and cry and weep and repent. He was working with a, a godly man that that man's influence touched his life. And God used that to deal with that man. I don't care if it's your first time or your 10th time or however many times it is. 
when God is with you. See, that's what's different is when it's God dealing with you. And if you've never been dealt with by God, you need to ask God to deal with you. And then if you have been dealt with by God, you are a blessed creature. You're a blessed human being that God was able to reach into your life and touch you and begin to deal with you and cause you to repent. See, when you do repent, and that word repentance, by the way, means to, it doesn't just mean, God, I'm sorry. It means to turn and go the other way. See, if you're walking in the way of the flesh, the fallen nature of Adam, you're walking in the way of sin, the sinful nature, but God deals with you. God calls you. And he deals with you in such a way that you make a decision that I am going to live for God. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to, I'm going to repent of my sins that I've committed and this will give you an answer of a good conscience towards God through faith. That's what water baptism is. I'm gonna make a public profession. Might not be very many people there. You may do it before the church, but you can get baptized. One preacher can take you into the water and baptize you if, God's, if God has uh, shown you and instructed you to be baptized and repent of your sins and what that is, is that that gives you a starting place. You can go back in your mind. I know when God, when I repented to the Lord and I made a decision and I publicly humbled myself and let myself be buried in water, which is a picture of burying this old life of this fallen Adamic nature. I'm going down in burial and when I come up, I've made up my mind. This is a profession that I've made up my mind to serve God and to follow him. And then you're, re you're ready. You're ready to receive. In fact, that's what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. They said to him, you know, when he began to preach, he, and, and they re all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all spake in tongues and prophesied and the people that listened came out. A multitude came out to hear this 120. They were so blessed in God that it created such a commotion that people came out in great numbers to hear it. When they heard Peter preach, they said, what must we do? Don't you know that there was an anointing of God there that pricked the hearts of every person that saw the manifestation of God's these 120, the 12 apostles and those that were with them, that it was about 120. Don't you know that there was a, you talk about a service. You talk about an operation of God that, that God brought life. After 4,000 years, he brought life to man in this world in the beginning of God's reconciling man to himself not just through all of the, what he brought man through the first 2,000 years and the second 2,000 years to finally bring them to Christ. See, those that died in faith on the old covenant, they, they have a good resurrection. I'm not gonna get off on that right now, but uh, God didn't forget none of those people. But it wasn't time yet. But when God brought Christ into this world, it was time for God to bring about a new covenant. And, and there on the day of Pentecost, Peter began to talk to those people. And there was such an anointing there. there were, it was so real. The Spirit of God was so rich that when he, after he began to talk, they begin to cry out, what must we do to be saved? Tell us what we need to do. He said, repent, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized and you shall receive the Holy Ghost, which it's for you 
It's for your children and it's for as many as be afar off. That is, whoever would receive it. Whosoever will, the scripture says, let him drink of the, of, of the river of life freely. See, this, this river of life, that's just a picture of water. That's the spirit, picture of the spirit of God, which is life. It, whosoever will, if you'll hear God, if you'll look into God's instruction of how to be saved, this is part of judgment. This is the beginning of judgment. God's instruction of how for you and how for me to be saved. And saints, we can't ever forget that part of salvation. I don't care how many mysteries you want to understand. And it's necessary to understand the sevenfold life, the full knowledge and understanding of God's plan. But if you leave the focus of this precious relationship, of this born again uh, experience with God, and then you begin to serve him and follow his instructions and you focus on that. You know, Jesus said, uh, one time talking to his disciples in Matthew 5, he said, if your eye offends you, cut it off. I mean, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. You know, I know, you know, we've taught that if that eye is a seer, if that's your your ministry. And we've used that as a ministry of, of babbling, confusion, places where we've been where men, we didn't really get fed properly and, and we had to cut that off. I know that's part of, of, you can use that scripture like that, but I know that what Jesus was saying is very simple. If you're, you get your eyes on things of this world, you, you get your eyes on lustful things. I'm talking about just, it may be, you know, just things. You get out of focus. Your focus gets off of God on things of this world. And if that's offending you, cut it off. Get that out of your focus. Get your focus back on God. That's what the Lord was telling the church at Ephesus. Get back to your first love. Do your first works over. Remember how precious it was when the Lord came into your life. And, uh, and if your hand offends you, cut it off. He, he didn't mean for you to actually take an ax and cut your hand off. He meant whatever you've set your hand to do, whatever you've put your hands to do in this world, if that's, if that's, uh, offensive to your soul. Cut that out of your life. Get that out and begin to get back to, to doing the, put your hand to the things of God and the hand of righteousness. You know, you've got a natural life. God doesn't want you not to live your natural life, but you are living in a world that you won't be, you can't become a part of. You may have been of the world, but once you're born again, you're no longer of it. You're born of God and God wants you to dwell in that new birth and develop in that under him, under righteousness. You know, he said one place, he said, you, man, you can't serve God and mammon. Mammon, he's talking about money there. You know, well, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with being successful and God blessing you financially. But if you get your focus on that, see, remember he also taught, don't take no thought for tomorrow. God, he, look, look at the lilies of the field and God clothes them with beauty. Look at the, uh, look how God takes care uh, of, of nature. And, and don't you know that you mean much more to God than that, Jesus said? See, but if our focus gets on things, I'm not so sure we are to just try to get richer and richer. If, we, if God blesses us financially, that we get our focus on that. You know, I think there has to be a balance where we're good stewards of what God's blessed us with. At the same time, our focus 
and our covetousness is not for that, not worldly things, but it's to bless the kingdom of God. It's to do what God's called us to do. And so uh, these are things of our first love that we're to keep our focus upon that is important in our relationship and our walk with God. More, you know, just like I said, Paul said, you can understand mysteries, but what, if you don't have charity, if you don't have the love of God, it's worthless. It means nothing. See, I, I don't care who you are. You can understand the mysteries of the Bible, but if you don't have the, the spirit of Christ, and you don't have the love of God working in you. That's been my desire here of late. Oh, God, help me. Help me, Lord God, to, to develop your love. Help me to love you, love righteousness, and that to be the focus of my life, that to be on my front burner. Nothing else gets ahead of that in my life. I'll tell you, saints, if we'll do that, God will bless us, and he'll help us continue to mature in this new man. Let's go back now. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, lay be labor, you know, too long because I'm about out of time. I mean, there's not a set time to this, but I try to keep it pretty close to an hour. Uh, I, I read verse twenty twenty three. Now twenty four says, "I'm in Saint John fourteen twenty four. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine." but the fathers which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, yet being present with you. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, so you thank God that he made it plain what that comforter was, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you'd rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I, and now I have told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. He's talking about Caiaphas, the high priest. They're going to take him and crucify him. They've already got plans to do so, and he knew that was coming. The Lord was preparing that him for that death on the cross. Uh, but, that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. So he, he continues to talk, but I just wanted to show you that in the very first chapter in my Father's house are many mansions, are many abodes. You are an abode of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, that born again nature of God, that you are to be born of, just like the disciples were. Look in Acts now in the first chapter. And I'll close with this, but I really didn't have too much, in, I didn't have any intentions of talking on this, but I'm glad the Lord put it in my mind because I think it's, it's a, it is a beautiful uh, message to understand that it, you must be born again and how that birth works to be born of God's spirit. See, we, uh, when God began to restore the church back in the Protestant movement with Martin Luther, the Protestant movement began and God worked in Protestantism actually for 360 years that finally brought us, uh, it started out in, in Germany. Uh, it really started before that, but, but God really, uh, he really got the, the Protestant movement in sway uh, in the 1500s through Martin Luther. And, um, uh, and then that worked from Germany uh, finally to the United States of America. That was back in the 1500s. 
15, 17, 15 at that time. But then, you know, finally God sent our forefathers to the United States of America to find freedom of religion because God wanted a place to restore his church in. And that's why the United States of America has been blessed above every nation in the world because of the hand of God that's been on America. However, America has forgot God. Remember what the psalmist said, the nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. And so uh, this nation is in, is in serious condition of God and it's due of God's judgment. And I, I don't see this nation turning. I hope, I wish this nation would turn back to God. But according to prophecy, we pretty well know, you know the way it looks to me is you're gonna vote here in a few days or those of you that are gonna vote. And I would wanna remind you I'm not, I, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for, but I am here to tell you the position of the church. And the position of the church, right now, the conservative party is trying to hold, hold to keeping the church intact and separation of church and state and hold the Constitution of the United States for things that are not uh, that are less morally wrong. I just have to admit that neither party, you know, our, our government's in trouble. But at least, if I was going to vote, I'd vote for. If I was going to tell you to vote, I'd tell you to vote for those that are 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 supporting the church and not supporting things that the that the Bible is adamantly against. Uh, Anyway, God's the one that's going to set up the new man in office. I just, my prayer is, God, give us a little more time. I'm hoping the church gets a little more time because I see this country is going to wind up a short-lived democracy and probably going to uh, a socialistic government in the, in the future. I'm hoping that we at least get another term of conservatism that protects the people of God somewhat. Anyway, in the book of Acts, uh, I'm going to read in the very first verse, very quickly, and I'll close. The former treaters have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he threw the Holy Ghost had given commandments of the apostles whom he had chosen. Before I read, I just want to mention this one thing. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, let me show you how important it was for his apostles to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost that he told them about in the 14th chapter of St. John. He didn't even resurrect to his father. When he resurrected, he went to where his apostles were and he breathed on them. He must have went up to them, stuck his face in their face, and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That's how important it was that they understood that Jesus, what he told them before he died, that I'm gonna go and prepare a place for you, and this Holy Ghost comforter, I'm gonna come to you. He's talking about coming to them in the spirit, me and my father will make our abode in you through the spirit, this new birth, this new nature that only, you can only receive from God. That's how important it was. Now here he is on the day of Pentecost after he resurrects. Verse three says, to whom he showed himself alive after the passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine a resurrected Christ for 40 days? <sighs> Wouldn't you like to just talk to the apostles what that was like? Then what did he tell you? Speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, 
which saith he, you've heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Well, you know the story. If you've read the book, if you read the first and second chapter, how that the Holy Ghost fell upon them, they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. There was something like 13 different there was Jews from 13 different nationalities where they had spread through the countries around that heard them all speaking in their languages. That was a miracle. They didn't only, see, they spoke in cloven tongues. Cloven means like a cloven hoof, like a split hoof, like a cow. There was two parts, cloven tongues. They spake in unknown tongues, but they spoke in known tongues also. That's a miracle of the Spirit of God. They were born of that. My Lord. And Peter said, they said, what must we do to be saved? Hallelujah. He said, <laughs> repent every one of you and be ye baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall Receive the Holy Ghost, which is for you, it's for your children, and it's for as many as be apart, far off. And God didn't just give it to the Jews, but, but Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, a proselyte to the Jewish religion, he was a Gentile, and God began to deal with Peter and began to deal with him. You probably know the story. An angel told him to send Cornelius, send a couple of your men to Simon the Tanner's house and get a man by the name of Peter and tell him to come, that an angel said for you to come and talk to us. Jesus saw that sheet come down from above and, and saw all of that, all of those animals that were forbidden for a Jew to eat under the dietary law of the old covenant. And God told Peter, said, eat I said, eat, rise, and eat. And Peter said, Lord, you know nothing's unclean to ever hit my mouth. Well, he was dwelling on that. God did that to him three times. See, what he realized was he wasn't, you know, a, Gen a Jew wasn't supposed to go into a Gentile's house. The things that were for the Jews weren't for Gentiles. But this angel told him, I mean, I mean, the men said an angel told Cornelius to send him to get you. So he went. And while he was talking to them about Jesus, the Spirit of God fell on Cornelius' house and they began to speak in tongues and prophesy. They, they received this message and Peter understood this is not just for us in this new covenant, but it's for the Gentiles also. And then he said, who could forbid water? In other words, we need to baptize them in water. They were kind of like a breech baby. <laughs> you know, a breech baby's born uh, feet first instead of head first, which is normal. But they received the Holy Ghost. They would have never probably baptized them in water had they not received the Holy Ghost. But when they received it, Peter said, my Lord, how can we forbid water? How can we forbid baptizing them in water? And let them fulfill all righteousness. That was one of the commandments. It's one of the commandments for you and I also. Praise God. Well, saints, get back to your first love. Do your first works over. Begin to work on that relationship of this new man. If you don't have the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, pray and ask God to give it to you. It's for you. It's for as many as be afar off, Peter said. And don't let anybody tell you. You know, they want to use the scripture to say where, where Paul told, said in the Corinthians, writing to Corinthians, he said, tongues will cease. Yes, it did cease because the church fell away. But it was restored after the Protestant movement for 360 years on when the Pentecostal movement started in Topeka, Kansas, in America, 
And then it went from Topeka to Houston, Texas. It went from Houston, Texas to Los Angeles, California in a little mission called on Azusa Street. And people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost by the droves. And that began to flood across America and the Pentecostal movement started. It's real, saints. It's exactly what God gave on the day of Pentecost. And it's available today. Keep it alive in your heart. If you've been born to the Spirit of God and you hadn't talked in tongues lately, find you a closet and get in it. Begin to pour your heart out to God. Let him know that you know that you need his spirit working in your life in a richer way, in a greater way. God bless your hearts. I love you. I love this man of Galilee, Jesus Christ, the son of the almighty God, my savior, my comforter, the prince of peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love him tonight, and I appreciate what he's done for me, and I want to do more for him. God bless you, and good night. In Jesus' name, pray for those, please, that we know of in the body of Christ that have this virus, this COVID-19. Pray for Sister Sherry. Uh, uh, I'm her, I, I know it starts with an R. Somebody give me, somebody type it up there. Um, my word. Sister Sherry in, in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, it was Sister Smith, Brother, Brother Smith and Sister Smith's Sorry. daughter. Huh? What? What? Riley, Sherry Riley. I had to get my wife to tell me. Sister Sherry Riley, she's got COVID-19. She's in the hospital. I think she's in ICU on CPAP. Uh, we thought at first she might have been on the ventilator, but she's not. Her husband put it on Facebook. She's on the CPAP machine. And uh, precious sister, uh, pray for her. Thank you, Brother Painter. We got it, Riley, Sherry Riley. And... Uh, but she needs our prayers. And then there's many in the Houston church that have it. Pray for the Wichita church. Brother and sister, brother Gary Green, Sister Green, they're doing well. They've not had to go to the hospital. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they're several in the Wichita church, but most of them have uh, mild uh, symptoms. They, none of them are in the hospital. They're all doing good. So, uh, brother, I've mentioned that brother Larry Bryant had COVID-19. He's, I think he's over it. He's doing well. Keep him in your prayers though. He, he does have some, uh, you know, some, uh, physical illness that he certainly needs our prayers. So keep him in your prayers. God bless you all. Have a good night. Those saints that are here, going to be here, uh, in church Sunday, uh, I'll see you then. God bless your hearts and have a good night.